so this is the this is the shooting fish in a barrel uh, uh, lecture. Uh, so what we need to really understand is how malware is created, how easy it's created, how it's dropped on a machine, uh, and how users can be tricked into uh, in, into uh, invoking it. Uh, and then what we're mainly interested in is the detection of it. So as we've seen, Snort, uh, Wireshark, and, and, uh, and firewalls and so on are, are, are tools to be able to detect this th type of thing. So really, if you think about it, the two main types of exploits that you'll see within a network, so often what you have is a, is a jump-off point. These servers, especially the domain controller, the domain controller is probably the main focus of, of a of a breach in a corporate network, because once the domain controller is breached, then the usernames and passwords and all the rights and things like that can be compromised. That's likely to be highly secured. There's going to be a bastion around it. It's going to have uh, excellent passwords and, and so on. There's going to be firewalls. It's going to be sitting in its, its own space <laughs> and, and protected. So what often happens is you have a a jump-off point, which might be a low-level computer on the edges of your network. So your core machines are all protected, but you actually find out there's a little computer that's sitting on the edge of your network that is on a remote site that nobody really cares about, but it's still connecting onto the network. So the jump-off point gives an intruder a way to get into the system and then jump off and discover uh, everything. The two main methods that are used to be able to compromise this machine it's typically through a phishing email, uh, so often, as, as long as one person clicks on that email and opens the PDF or the Java program or the Flash, uh, if they haven't patched their, patched their system, then that gives uh, an anchor point uh, for the software. What typically happens with a botnet is then there's a callback to download the proper malware. So the, the, first, the first anchor point is really just a... Uh, a point to be able to, to download the, the, the malware. The malware is then uh, added to the machine. It's then used as a, as a jump off point. The other method is to trick the user into, into downloading from something like a pirate bay, and that's a back door. So you trick the user into uh, downloading a, a compromised uh, DLL or EXE onto the machine. So what happened with the iWorm? With the iWorm, all these people went to download the Adobe software from Pirate Bay, and it was just full of uh, backdoors. So all that really happened there was that uh, there was a, the EXEs and the executables on a Mac are just as compromisable as a Windows machine. So close your mind to thinking that it's just, it's just EXEs on, uh, on Windows that are compromised, Android, iOS, uh, Apple is just a Linux machine running on an Intel uh, architecture, so the code itself is, is, is much the same. So what will often happen is that there's an EXE in there, the user runs the EXE, they're quite happy with Photoshop, but uh, in the back background there's a callback, go hello, <laughs> and as we've seen, Meterpreter or a shell or something like that is actually on the machine, and the user would never act actually know. So virtually every, every, uh, every EXE can have, uh, an, an ex uh, can have something stuffed into it uh, that, uh, that could compromise the system. Okay, so this is our, our basic classifications. Uh, so in this one, we'll be looking at the exploit, and then we'll also be looking at the, the, back, the back door to be able to uh, create something that is a hook it gets the, gets the intruder into the, into the system. And you could say it's a bit like a Trojan horse, and this is the problem with malware, <laughs> and this is why you can't really get a taxonomy for malware, because it's a bit of everything. <laughs> so uh, getting somebody to download Photoshop with a backdoor is a Trojan and an exploit and, and, a, and a backdoor altogether, and probably even a bit of ransomware in there, and a bit of a worm and a bit of a virus. <laughs> So really, nobody's ever really properly classified uh, each of, the, each of the, the malware that you get. Okay, so this is what we looked at before. This is our, our basic classification. This is as good as we can actually get. And it certainly shows you the main stages that, uh, that how you would classify your malware. 
And remember, your malware may be morphing through different stages here. So the first one is the touch point, followed by the proper malware, uh, and, then, and then so on. Okay, so we've got our distribution method. So as I said, the distribution method was a phishing email, or it was a, or it was a, a backdoor from, a, from Pirate Bay, say. Some observable events, there's some system compromise in there. Some way that they normally stay persistent on the system. If they compromise a standard Windows program, then they're going to be, going to be there all, all, all the time. Some sort of trigger that happens, the user will run the command, say. That's obviously one method. Uh, in the past, the registry has been used as startup uh, and, and so on. Then there are some, and this is where we want to be able to see. Remember that we're in disk, on disk at rest, we're in memory, or we're on the air, okay? So the malware is going to exist in each of those three stages. You need to make sure that you're detecting it at uh, each of these. The malware arriving, the malware doing something on the system, and the malware sleeping for a while. Malware getting itself alive again, uh, and, and so on. So it's, a, it's always a, a catch-up with the malware writers. Something gets fixed on your virus scanner, and then the malware writers go and do something actually uh, uh, different. With the crypto lockers now, uh, they're running as a standalone, and they're not really doing any connections to the back office, which means that you can't detect that network connection of it. Hello, I'm here, uh, and, and so on. A botnet will, will quite happily exist without actually contacting his master for a, for a long, long time. A signal comes in uh, for it, and it will become alive uh, again. Okay, so a, a, a piece of malware will typically stay for a year, year and a half on, on a network without actually being uh, uh, detected. Even while it's running and doing its bad stuff, it's sitting there uh, doing it. So your IDS systems really need to be tuned very much uh, ar around uh, uh, an early detection. So as we saw before, one method that we use is a static analysis. So we actually find out that somebody has installed a piece of malware on our system. First thing we do is we pull up a hex viewer uh, to have a look at the code. Where did it come from? Are they using a kit? Did they craft this themselves? Are they using C++? Is it a Java program? And we really need to, you have a finite, in an instant response, you have a finite amount of time. I mean, you're not going to be going over a network for days and weeks and stuff like that. Uh, basically, you pull all the artifacts off <laughs> in a big bag, typically in a seam type thing. You pull it in a big bag and then it's off site. Uh, like in a bank, you're not going to shut down the cloud or the whole network infrastructure. Shut it down, shut it down. Let's take all the equipment, that mainframe over there, shut it down, let's put it in the back of a lorry. That isn't going to happen uh, anymore. So more and more, we're pulling off stuff and then we're taking it uh, back office. Uh, but if it's a really critical incident, then you might be on site and then you might be analysing the, the hex code to see uh, where it came from and quickly make some, some judgments. Okay? So as we've seen, we've got sites such as VirusTotal that will allow us to be able to see if we can find a signature for the malware. But you have polymorphic uh, uh, malware which can change its signature whenever it wants. So it'll scramble itself, it'll never have the same hash signature you change one bit that, that is a no operation in the code and, and it will change the, the hash in there. Okay, so the malware writers are, 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 are understanding about the, the basic signatures that, that are actually in, in there. And then, as we've seen, what we do is our, do our dynamic analysis. So the days of static analysis are kind of gone. Uh, now, you can only going to tell so much about, about how the thing actually works. So the, uh, many of the far Many of the firewalls now will pop the, the program off out of the network packets and stick it in a sandbox uh, the, uh, and let it run. <laughs> okay, so an executable comes in and then it's actually taken off into, into a, a, a place where it, it can be allowed to, to run and, and so on. So our dynamic, our dynamic analysis lets us actually see what the system's actually, what the malware's actually doing, what, it's, what files it's touching, uh, what, what network connections it's using, 
what it's doing in the registry, uh, and, and so on. And then for us, we look at some sort of packet analysis. So with the packet analysis, what we want to really be able to do is to capture it in transit, and then pull off uh, a signature that's, that's unique, so we don't end up with any false positives uh, in, in there. Okay, and just because it looks like an EXE, it doesn't end up looking like that in the end. If it's in an email, it's in a base64 uh, format. Also, the, the malware writers scramble one character's octal, another character's hexadecimal, another character is decimal, and then it's octal again. So they use different types of encoders to encode the JavaScript uh, strings. So your, your, your scanner is looking for an invoke method or JavaScript functions and it just won't see them because they're all scrambled uh, bits, of, bits of a string are, are mangled but when you bring them together they're, they're all there. So the obfuscators do their business uh, very well. Okay, so how do we, how do we actually create or how does, a, how does an intruder actually create the, the, the malware? So we can use MSF Venom uh, to be able to take our payload and to stuff our payload into the, into the executable. So the way it's normally done is with our, with our Ruby script uh, here. So there's our Ruby script. So these are the, the parameters down here that are actually defined. When we run our, our Metasploit, those are the parameters that come up by default. But sometimes we've actually got to, to run them. So something like the local host uh, needs, to be, needs to be set uh, because that will be our dialback uh, address. Okay, so there's the, there's the parameters coming through from the, the Ruby script. Uh, from there to there, that's the default values that they are if we don't actually uh, set them uh, with, with inside there. Uh, it also has a default uh, architecture. So in MSF Venom, we can set whether it's a, like a, an Android ARM or we can set the, the hardware or the executable that, that needs to be run. You can see by default, this is just going to be a, a standard Intel x86 uh, type uh, 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 executable. Okay, so this is the this is the PowerShell our uh, Ruby script, and I'll give you a demo uh, uh, in, in, in a little minute to, to show that. Uh, but this is the payload here that's actually injected into the uh, into the exe. So what happens is that uh, the MSF Venom we'll find a point in the program where there's a jump in the program to take it somewhere else. Rather than doing a jump, it will jump to this script here. So this script is the shell code that, that will run. After that, it then goes back to where it would have went normally in, into the program. So as far as the program is concerned, it doesn't actually know that it's taken this extra jump because it's still going back to where it's, it's actually meant to be uh, 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 going. Okay, so when, when you create the EXE, so in this case I'm taking PuTTY, so PuTTY is just a standard uh, SSH uh, telnet type, type connection. So we're taking PuTTY and then we're actually creating our PuTTY EXE. So I've called that like with an extra X, but obviously uh, the intruder would just call it PuTTY.exe. If the, what would the user do to stop them falling into this trap. What should you always do? <laughs> Download from an authorised site. site and also check the file name, check the file name and also file uh, the hash signature. Okay, so don't ever download anything uh, without actually checking the the, the zip signature or the EXE signature. So this will obviously change uh, the EXE uh, MD5 uh, signature. So if you download it and you actually find that it's not the right one that's published on the website, uh, then don't download it. There's something not quite right uh, at, at about that. So we can take virtually any Windows EXE. So in the lab we'll do it with Notepad. So Notepad, the user would never know, but, but someone has accessed the machine they access Notepad, they stick on a new Notepad, the new Notepad has a, has a dialback. So in this case, this is a, this is a dialback uh, shell script that will dial back on port 443. Why do they use 443? Yeah. Yeah. 
So it's really allowed. 80 and 443 are normally allowed out. They are the SINs that are allowed out of the network. Other ones tend not to be. FTP could be banned, Telnet, SSH and so on. But you're always going to get out in 443. It's not creating an encrypted tunnel at all. <laughs> it just tunnels through that. So one of the ways that you should really set up your network scanner is on 443, if you detect hello, <laughs> uh, stop, <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> so you should never be able to see what's in 443 at all because it's all encrypted. If you detect standard text or something that looks like it's, it's kind of standard English, that isn't a tunnel and people are tunneling through that, 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 that port. So more and more, we're ending up with two ports on a network, 443 and 80, and that's basically it. <laughs> Everything goes through there. So people can be FTPing quite happily through port, port 80 or 443 if they want. So make sure that you examine uh, those, those things. Okay, so that's, that's our, that's, we create our EXE in the lab today. What we'll do is we'll, 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 we'll go ahead and, uh, and set up our, our EXE. And so this is the, this is the payload uh, from our Ruby script. And we can see here, this is the executable that's been created. This is our, our putty.putty.exe. And there you go. So this is the little bit that allows the, the extra code to be added into it. And it's difficult to see <laughs> that from here. Uh, but that says FCE8820000. Okay? So we see over here, FCE8820000. And so this is where the, where the actual script has, has actually been uh, set up uh, in, the, in, the, in the executable. Okay, so it's important that, that we actually know the, uh, we know when this is happening. I appreciate it's very difficult for you to see that, but I'll set it up in a little minute. Uh, but this is the Ruby script uh, that, uh, that, that we're actually using. And you can see the payload part uh, in, in here. Uh, and that's the thing that the, the scanner on the network really needs to be taking a signature of that uh, and making sure that, uh, that it can actually be detected. You can't just assume that your virus scanner is going to pick up everything. You've got to be watching Metasploit every day uh, and seeing what the new ones are because your virus scanner is going to take a, a while to catch up uh, all, all the time. So when a new vulnerability uh, comes along and it's added to Metasploit, uh, so within a day the Heartbleed one was, was, was there, uh, so people could craft their, their, their Metasploit, Heartbleed. Uh, all the other ones, within a day, it's, it's added and people update. So you really need to keep up to date and know the basic signatures. Uh, so how, how do you create a payload? Well, I'll do a little demo in a minute. Okay, so 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 what what we'll do is we'll have a we'll have um, we'll have a, just a short break of uh, of five minutes or so when I get set up, uh, and then we'll have a little uh, demo, a real life demo of uh, of our, our setup of our of our malware. Okay, right. Just just to show uh, what we'll do is is we'll use a standard we'll use a standard exe. So we use Notepad. So we're in, in the lab, we'll do putty, but I, I'll do it. I'll do it on on Notepad. So Notepad is a standard uh, EXE that we would use uh, on a Windows machine. Uh, and obviously, when the user runs Notepad with the malware, there'll be a dial back, and then we'll get a Metapeta uh, shell uh, from there. The user will never know that uh, there's been that dial back and uh, it's actually the machine has been, been compromised. Okay, so, so what we'll do is, uh, is I'll get set up. So, so we've got, uh, just let me copy, copy that. I'll get that set up. Okay, so I've got uh, my Windows machine here. You can see that from there. So just, just to show that, uh, that it, show it working. So that's me going into System32. And, and there's, there's, there's no plan. I appreciate you can't really see that that well. The demo that, that I'll have online, you'll actually be able to see it. 
So the Windows machine is running uh, a web server. So you remember, where, where would I copy uh, notepad.exe into if I wanted to copy it into my Kali machine over the, over the web? What folder on Windows runs the default web server? Was it? In I net pub. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, so uh, what I'll do is I'll copy Notepad into uh, I net pub WW root. Okay. So I appreciate it's a bit difficult to see that one from there. But if you just uh, <laughs> just bear with me, uh, maybe I'll make that a bit bigger. From there. Okay. So I'm copying Notepad into I net pub WW root. Okay, so just to make sure that I'm not tricking you here. <laughs> uh, so let's go in there, and then I'll run Notepad from in there, and everything's fine. Okay, so everything's great. <laughs> uh, we can do an MD, quick an MD5 uh, hash of it. I've got it on here. Yeah, I'll have to do that. But the, uh, we'll, we'll take the, the file size just now. You just remember that one. So the file size is six, about 68, 68, 68 key uh, in there. So what we're going to do is to copy Notepad onto Kali, then we'll use MSF Benham, and then we'll copy it back on, and then we'll run it back uh, again. We'll just prove that it's actually changed. We'll put it into another folder. Uh, we'll get Metasploit running to be able to, to listen to the callback, uh, and then hopefully we can get it all set up. <laughs> Okay, so I just go over here, just find out what my IP address is over here. So we're not on 163. So over here, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to download from 163. So it's uh, 10. 10.200. So speak to me. 10.200.0.163, was it? Great. Okay, so I'm just going to save it. I'm going to save it into there. Yeah. So just going to see what it is. Yeah. Okay, then from, from there, uh, so we should have our, our notepad exe there. So just let me get rid of an old one that I created. There's, there's our, there's our, see it, but there's our notepad.exe, you can see 68 k and it's a clean, it's a clean uh, note, notepad from, from there. So the scripts that we're, at, the script that we're actually going to use for our malware, and you'll find that they are contained in the, in this folder here, we share Metasploit, Framework, Modules, Payload, Stagers, this is this is where all our when when you put in Android slash JavaScript view, it's actually getting it from the Ruby script in, in these folders here. So it's a Windows uh, one that we're actually looking at. So there's all the ones uh, that we get for for Windows. So the one we're using is the reverse TCP uh, Ruby script, and and that, that that's it there. So that's the script that we saw before. Uh, when we when we looked at the when we were in the presentation, okay. So a standard way to detect this is really to detect that that binary string, and we'll see that in a little minute. Okay. So if we just then go ahead, and what we'll do is we'll create our, our exploit. So I'm trying to find where it is first. Okay. So I'm just going to copy that. Yeah. Paste that in. That's not the right paste there. Let's see if I've got a previous one already there. Yeah, that's it. Okay, so I piece it's a bit difficult to see it from there, but this is the MSS Venom. Uh, this is the, the reverse TCP shell. Uh, the host is the IP address of the, of the counting machine. 443 is what we're going to download it as. 
there's the, edit, the, the, the additional script that we're adding. So base 64 encoding uh, encodes it into a base 64 string. Uh, the export is invoked from PowerShell. So PowerShell is a standard part of, of Windows uh, now. So this this will invoke the PowerShell to be able to get the, the script to run. We're taking the exe and then we're producing this notepad x dot dot exe. Okay, so it should just take a little minute. There's three iterations that it goes through to actually create the, the executable uh, file. Uh, it should get there in a minute, hopefully. So once this is created, what's the folder? If I start my Apache web server, what's the folder on Kali Linux that I would copy my executable into so I can copy it back to Windows again? www bar www okay we've got that one there oops yeah, just let me fix this a wee bit so it should be command I'll do it this time okay so what we're going to do is that we're going to take the notepad x and we're going to stick it into the var www folder we're going to put it back and then we're going to run it off the, the Windows machine. Uh, so we're going to start this spot first and listen for it. Uh, and then, so it's, it's worked this time. Okay, so if I do an LS, hopefully it's there. Okay, so that's there. It's increased itself. It's got a bit fatter. It's now 109k, so it's a bit more bloated. There, it's, it's managed to, to gain about 40k of, a, of, a, of an additional payload in there. The user will never know that as long as the system isn't really checking file sizes and, and things like that. Uh, so often it's important to run Tripwire. Tripwire will spot that something has actually changed uh, on the system. That looks a bit strange. It has all the hash signatures and, and so on. If a new file drops in that place where it's watching, then, then it will do that. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy our notepad uh, there into uh, var www. Okay, so just to show that I'm not cheating uh, there, so we'll just we we'll just have a look in there. Okay, so that was created on the second of April at um, just after half past nine. Okay, so it, it's a totally fresh. Uh, copy. So what I'll do over here now is that I'm going to access just the, hopefully I've got the right IP address here. Yeah, so it's uh, 88. So what we're going to do is that we're just going to pop pop the EXE back onto the Windows machine. We'll just make sure it's running okay before we start Metasploit. <laughs> if it's going to crash in us then it's, then it's, no, it's no good to actually start Metasploit uh, just now. So what we'll do is we'll just uh, get our notepad back off, notepad X, yeah, okay, there it's there. And then what we'll do is that we'll just uh, use it here, okay, so I'll just run it and hopefully it don't crash in me please, okay, so everything's fine. So you agree that is, there's nothing wrong with, with that. It's not, it, whoops, what, what happened there? Did it, I didn't kill it. Did I kill it? Is it gone? Let's download it again. It's okay, yeah, so, so it's okay. So that, that's our notepad x.exe, so everything, everything looks okay as far as the user's intent. So, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll close it down now and then back on my Kali machine uh, I'll just go back to where I was and then let's uh, let's run the uh, next spot. So, so what we'll do is we'll, we'll sit waiting for the 443 dial back. So it doesn't have to be Metasploit, it can be quite happily just a, a back-end uh, system that's waiting for the, the connection. So as I said, we all still a dial back because most, most people are, are behind that. And it's very difficult to tell where someone is. So the machine will dial you back, it will get through the NAT router uh, where it's difficult for us to dial in uh, to, to a machine. Okay, so we'll just get that started up.
and then what we'll do is that um, let's get the whole thing running. Okay, so here's my here's my exploit here for my malware, and just let me get this set up first. Okay, so just standard. We're going to use Meterpreter for our shell. Uh, the payload is a 10 uh, for our options 10 200 0 88. We're going to set a port and then we're just going to go ahead and do that. Okay, so everything's fine there. So we'll just paste that in. <laughs> Sorry, we'll. we'll uh, Seem to have left something in there. Seem to have uh, I don't know, let's, let's do it. Uh, let's do it manually. Sorry, I left. I left in. I left in something to start there. Just try one more time to copy and paste. Better. Okay, so it's just setting waiting on 443 on, on our, our address. Okay, so I'll just set this over here and then I'll get my Windows machine. Let's see if I can make that go there. So now I'm going to bring up Windows here. Here we are. there so you can actually see the, the connection actually happening hopefully okay so there's our there's our exe there's our metasploit this is a standard notepad as far as the user is concerned haha <laughs> okay so the user has just run has just run a uh, notepad it's done a, a dial back and over here So the user is running this as a, as, a, as a system admin. So we can see the hash dump uh, there. Uh, we can we can move around, and there's downloads, and we can move around the system. Uh, we normally get our the unique ID from them. Let's get the help command. So obviously, if the, if the user had a webcam, then it's possible to get the webcam as, as we've seen before. But all the standard uh, Metasploit's Metapreter commands are, are actually in, in there. Okay, so you see how easy it is for somebody to create a piece of malware uh, and then to be able to deploy it as something that looks fairly standard. Uh, so it would have been just as easy for me to create the same thing for my Mac uh, and for me to put put say a, a Tor, uh, not a Tor, a, 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 a peer to peer type type share. Uh, so don't don't download from from peer to peer shares. <laughs> you just never know where what you're actually uh, downloading uh, from there, because obviously just somebody goes in and changes one of the D the DLLs or the EXEs, and they have a backdoor into the machine. So we've investigated so many machines, Macs and Windows machines. Uh, I, one of the iPhones we investigated was riddled, absolutely riddled with, with back doors uh, on it, uh, sending, sending all the telephone numbers on the contact lists. Uh, Android devices too, it's not too difficult to change an APK file, uh, a, a, a binary uh, from the Android device to that. So really don't trust anything, especially from non-trusted sites uh, like the, the torrent type, type sites. So that will only uh, happen if I have a rooted device. Let's say a rooted iPhone yeah. it will not happen if I, the one if I download. Yeah. No, the, ones, the one that we investigated wasn't rooted at all. It was a standard iPhone uh, and, and it was absolutely riddled 
Yeah, but in that case, um, the only way to get this stuff from the iPhone. Oh yeah. Oh, but 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 yeah. You you've got to get it, and, and it's typically some sort of JavaScript or something. It, it's not like an executable. That's 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 that you're downloading. It's it's through some exploit through JavaScript mm -hmm. that it manages to, to to get it into the background. But you're right. It, it will try to protect you by only going to the Apple or the Google site. Uh, but again, especially with the Google site, uh, applications can appear for a short time. They tend not to be as rigorous as Apple to be able to assess them, uh, and and there might be malware. In fact, every piece of software is a piece of malware, really, because it says it tells you it's going to read your telephone numbers, it's going to read your contact addresses, and it's going to read all these things, and you just click on it, basically. But you're giving it permission, and it's siphoning off. So even something that looks valid has access to your system, uh, the whole system, uh, and your memory, and all the apps that are actually running it. Okay, so even trusted apps actually app can be uh, getting data off, off of them. Okay, so you can actually see how easy it is for, for an intruder to be able to, to compromise a standard EXE. Uh, so we could have done it with any EXE on, on the system it would have worked uh, quite quite happily. So make sure that you, you always check uh, the on, on the system to, to see uh, what's actually there. So if we, if we actually have a look at the file system, hopefully. So there you go. Uh, that's 107k for our notepad uh, here. Okay, so you can actually see that it is, it is the new notepad uh, that's that's running and it's not. I've not set this up uh, at, at all. You can trust the professor. <laughs> I still have the question: where, where did you get your payload from? So uh, from from Metasploit. Yeah, but I mean, um, somebody must have written the the code to get the uh, to, to create the dialog. Uh, that's right. So that that was part of the MSS Venom was was that that addition of the code. The minus E option adds the. The, so the, the shell code into it. Yeah. Uh, so the so if we actually have a look at uh, so the so what we're more interested in we're interested in, in investigating of course we are but we're also mainly interested as good guys for actually uh, investigating the, the code itself. So the code I can't remember what the what the code was that we were looking for. Just to try and find it. Uh, so just let me, let me get back to uh, where our exploit was. Uh, so the code we're looking for, it's difficult to see that, is FCE882. Can somebody remember that? So it's FCE882. Can you write that down? Okay. Oh, sorry. Already. <laughs> so we tend to be looking for hex or strings or so on. So what we're looking for is FCE882, and hopefully it's found it. So there it's there. Okay. So this is the inserted code in, in here. So you can see that's been inserted from, from the, the Ruby script uh, that, that was there. Uh, so Python Python is, is obviously a, a way that the intruders can actually craft, quickly craft the payloads. So if you look at uh, something like the Heartbleed uh, vulnerability, the Heartbleed vulnerability, then if you look at Python code, just to try and find my Heartbleed. This this was available within hours of the of the exploit being being available. Uh, so somebody is very quick at crafting payloads. So there's the there's the standard uh, heartbeat request packet. So all somebody's done is very quickly craft the the packet, and these are the different uh, responses that come back. If you remember, the four zero is actually I've got a 16k payload, but the payload isn't actually there. 
So that's the little bit that it puts onto the end, number puts onto the end, depending if it's SSL 3 or TLS 1.1. If the Python script detects what type of connection and then changes the actual, the actual payload, uh, depending on it. So within a couple of hours, you have a Python script, you have your, you have your Ruby script in, in uh, Metasploit, uh, and it could be on your site tomorrow, uh, and, and that's before McAfee or anything uh, or semantic catches up, then, 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 then you've lost it. So it's a, it's a continual battle uh, all the time uh, to, to be able to keep up to date uh, from, from that. Okay, so that, that, that's, that's, a, that's a Ruby script uh, there uh, from it. Uh, so certainly anything that's in here is, is a well-known uh, script. Okay, does anybody have any questions at all? We'll be doing it in the lab, so, so don't worry. I appreciate you have a test, so you might not be doing it in the lab, but you'll be doing, you'll be doing it as a practical sometime. Any questions? No? Good. We well, can have an extra hour to, to study for your test. <laughs> If you want to come up the lab, it would be great, but I appreciate that you might not want to because of your test, so, so that, that's fine. But I'll be there, and uh, we'll all be there. I'll be there waiting for you, but uh, uh, if we don't see you, then have a really nice uh, Easter. And it's been really fun teaching uh, the module, and obviously we'll have another week when we come back uh, again. What I might do is I might, give, I might give another demo of this. I'll give you a different one so that the people who want here can actually uh, have a little look at, uh, at this. Okay, good. You're free. <laughs>